Trauma Therapist Podcast, episode 430. All right, guys, welcome to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to raise awareness of trauma and to support new trauma therapists just starting out on their trauma-informed journey. I do that through this podcast and my membership community, Trauma Therapist 2.0. If you're a therapist of any kind interested in learning about trauma and you're looking for support and inspiration, I invite you to check out Trauma Therapist 2.0 by going to traumatherapist2.com. That's traumatherapist, the number two, dot com. All right, let's get started. All right, guys, I just want to say that I am thrilled to have this podcast sponsored by cptsdfoundation.org. You know, a little while ago, I actually got to meet the founder, uh, Athena Moberg, of CPTSD Foundation. We met here in San Francisco, sat down, uh, had breakfast, and it was amazing. It, it, you know, I got to feel and see her passion, the passion that she has for this work, and not just for therapists and clinicians, but survivors as well. CPTSD Foundation provides peer led support and adjunctive care in between therapy sessions for survivors of complex trauma. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, survivors can come together to give and receive support and validation and feel equipped with the knowledge and skills they can use every day. You can check it out at cpsdfoundation.org. Their website is amazing. They have daily recovery support. They have free support groups. They have a healing book club. And Trauma Therapist podcast listeners can get 50% off the first month when they join the daily recovery support calls. So you can check that out by going to cptsdfoundation.org forward slash trauma therapist podcast. Once again, that's cptsdfoundation.org slash trauma therapist podcast. Or just head on over to the website at traumatherapistpodcast.com and click on the link there and you'll be in business. This episode is sponsored by Somatic Experiencing. Trauma may be a fact of life, but it doesn't have to be a life sentence. Somatic Experiencing is a psychobiological method of addressing clients' physical and emotional trauma conditions and helps to give voice to their experiences without a need for them to retell their story. SE focuses on regulation of the nervous system and offers the opportunity to engage, complete, and resolve the body's instinctual responses to traumatic experiences. For more information regarding somatic experiencing and the SE professional training program, the Trauma Therapist Podcast listeners can visit traumahealing.org forward slash TTP. That's traumahealing.org forward slash TTP. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have back a very special guest, Professor Muli Lahad. Uh, Dr. Lahad, welcome back. Hi, I'm very happy to be here with you. So Dr. Lahad is a senior medical psychologist. And he's been working with individuals, civilians, as well as soldiers and veterans suffering from PTSD since 1975. Dr. Lahad is a founder and president of the Community Stress Prevention Center in Kiryat Shmona, Israel, the oldest center in the world that deals with community as an ecological entity for recovery and healing pre- and post-critical incidents. Dr. Lahad is the author and co-author of 35 books on resiliency and coping from early childhood to old age. He has developed the integrative model of coping and resiliency. His most recent book, is the lonely ape that told himself stories, the necessity of stories for human survival. Dr. Lahad, welcome back. You know, before we were recording, you said, you know, when when you saw my invitation, you were you were happy and surprised, and you were wondering why I wanted to have you back. And I'll, I'll I wanted to share that with everyone. I've been doing this for you know a few years now, and after four hundred plus interviews naturally there are certain interviews that that stick with you and there are certain people that stick with you that certainly stick with me and you're one of those people because of your passion plain and simple and and that's what this is about you know i hope this this podcast is about that passion the human spirit and 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 for helping other people at at its most elemental so welcome back Thank you very much. I'm really honored. So, 
let's um you you joined us back on episode 101 for those people who maybe didn't catch that episode and i would definitely encourage people to to after they hear this to go back and listen to that give us a snapshot if you would muli of um where where you're located and um the 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 how you got into this and then we'll dive into what we were talking about before okay um i'm living in the north of israel uh or in general in israel because i would say that israel is a natural laboratory for trauma and resilience and all that um the story of how i got into it is a very kind of simple story in many ways but yet special for me um, I came to a place that was in those days, in 1979, uh, under constant shelling and lots of fears from uh, what then was um, considered terrorist attacks, or some people would call it political uh, uh, um, uh, in conflicts or whatever. Kiyachmona was a very remote town at that time. It's still the, the very northern town of Israel, but then in those days from Tel Aviv to Kiyachmona, it was over four and a half hours in a country that altogether from north to south is 500 kilometers. It's, it looks as if it was far, far away. And I came for one year because I wanted to work with the children there who were uh, under shelling and, and terrorist infiltration for uh, since the early 70s. And um, what I realized, and this was, I, I, I would say, the, the turning point, is that people are making it. People are living despite ongoing threat and, you know, every so often uh, shelling. And they make it, they leave, they, they, they marry, they have, of course, bad times and happy times. But altogether, they manage. And so I started to look into the question. And in those days, it was mostly termed coping. Nowadays, it might be seen as resilience. And uh, that led me to my first uh, study and then a, a series of studies on how people are making it in impossible situations and ongoing situations where adults and kids are in the same, uh, under the same threat. Early on when I studied, it was mostly on patients or on, on soldiers, and here it was civilians. And so the basic pH, which we talked last time, uh, the model came out. And uh, I realized that there is a lot of, I would say, challenges and many, many things that I can uh, uh, experiment with and develop. And that the field is very, very open, at least in those days, for creative approaches. I think I mentioned to you that when I started talking about resilience or coping in, that ma in this manner, uh, in the early 80s, uh, late 70s, people thought that I'm probably affected by the rockets. And I'm probably also a bit confused because... Who was talking about people making it? Trauma meant only to make you disabled, not to uh, make you thrive. So um, I believe that um, ha since then, things have changed. And um, there later on, I developed or uh, developed more methods, mostly using creative methods with the trauma uh, processing and a lot of time spent on developing resilience programs and opening the first, I would say, uh, community stress prevention center, which is nowadays would have again been called a resiliency center rather than mm -hmm. <laughs> stress prevention, um, which is basically working throughout the year, not just following a crisis. I mean, we worked then and we still work on what might be seen as a kind of inoculation or, or helping people to develop those methods that can help them in times of distress. And I think that I mentioned one last thing, and with that I'll, I'll stop, is that what I found that recovery from trauma needs to be in the ecology of uh, support. It means you need to look at the community, you need to look at the family in order to help those who are affected to recover really. Um, since then, I'm mostly dealing with um, the power of imagination and playfulness 
in helping people to recover mm. from trauma. Wow. Okay, so so many things are coming into my mind here. The first of which is just a, a, a reaction, and I, I know I had this last time. I could not imagine living in a zone where the, the, there's the ever-present threat of these bombings, of these shellings. I mean, and you're talking about this, this you were surprised to see people coping, like th- almost... What, would you use the word thriving or getting through? Yes, getting- some did, but I mean, all the, the, the main impression that I had is that what I studied and I, I came to the North from a mental health, a very heavy mental health institute, which told me that uh, to look for pathology all the time. And, and here I did see pathology, but I also saw people making it, living. Uh, some of them, of course, thriving, but I wasn't talking about then about post-traumatic growth. I was just saying, well, not everyone is affected and people can live in such situations. And what what surprised me and what made me study, what actually is helping them? That was the main question because I came with preconceived ideas of what is the effect of trauma. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So what did, what did you find? Well, I, I actually found in, in the very early studies that people are using various methods that could be seen as a defense mechanism. And I immediately thought the concept of defense is, is stopping the world from coming in, where I, I thought maybe the better way to look at it is how do they go out to the world? meet the world. And so the first studies was done with children and adults. And, and I, I was surprised to see that, of course, there are differences, but altogether they're using this, what I call the six channels that I mentioned last time, which is the belief system. That means people who have either self-esteem or an outside belief, like religious belief, or, or they're looking for meaning. What, what does it mean to me that I'm living in this situation? The second way that we found is the affective mode. Those For them, uh, uh, meeting the challenge is by expressing their emotions, either directly or indirectly. That could be through music, through meditation, whatever. And um, then I looked at the other channels, which is the, the third one is social. That means those who are thriving or, or coping or making it, by either taking a role or or needing to be in a group or or taking upon uh, themselves a role with others uh asking for support and with the teachers i found that for them what was very important is that there is a system it means there is a system that supports them whilst they are taking care of so many kids mm-hmm. then uh the other uh, way we found was imagination. That's the I of the basic pH, and the I means you are using imagination. And basically, that was the the beginning of my studies about the impact of imagination. Because again, in my upbringing, and I know that I have two PhDs, and I did lots of studies, and and what I learned in the past was that imagination is basically a way to understand your um, subconscious and all this. And here I could see how people using imagination, humor, creativity, uh, and other ways of being, um, what do you call it, Um, improvisation to make it. So I started listening and looking into that, and we might talk about it later. And that's the imagination. Then, of course, cognition, which is very, very known. Those who are mostly focused on problem solving, making sense of things, making priority orders, and etc. And the last uh, uh, mode of coping that we found was the physical one. That is either being active, but not only active. I mean, again, there was a, a misunderstanding that only if you are active coper, you are really coping. But I found mm-hmm. that. Some people have a passive mode, like uh, relaxation, like going to sleep, like eating. And 
again, because I came from clinical psychology background, all of that were looked as a negative way, an unproductive way. And I said, no, no, look at how mm -hmm. these people are using it in order to make it through ongoing situations of, as you said, shelling, infiltration of, of terrorists, etc. Now, just to be clear, these um, qualities or elements that you're talking about, these were utilized by people kind of unconsciously, not as... Or, spontaneously. Right, spontaneously, right. They weren't, yes. oh, I'm going to go to the therapist and learn how to do X or Y. This is just what they were doing naturally. Indeed, indeed. My, my, my main quest in this life is to look how people recover on their own, what helps them. And after observing and learning about it, I try to see if we can make a model or just learning from what is helpful to people. Now, I was talking as if it's either or, but people can be both imaginative and cognitive, both emotional mm -hmm. and physical. I mean, they can use variety of those. And the more channels you have, the more ways you have, the more flexible. And only in later years, I would say in the late 90s, the idea of resiliency as flexibility came about in, in the uh, uh, professional books. We already talked about it in 1982, but we didn't know that the concept of flexibility, but the ability to use a variety of modes was very apparent with those who really had hard times, but could recover on their own accord, on the, in their own way. And this is a spontaneous. I, I, I definitely say, in hindsight, after we studied the way and we started teaching these modes, people could learn to use it. But the basic thing was that we were looking at how people are coping and analyzing it into this or categorizing into these six channels, as we called it. Is one one of the things that you know we're not alone here in in the states and in the West about the the stigma of, of post traumatic stress disorder, the stigma of trauma. Just being able to talk about it is is a is a great first step. Did you find that, given the the context and the situation, that people were more understanding or more accepting of the fact well that, that this is could potentially be traumatic that we are living in a this type of zone was that I, I, I hope that I understood you uh, correctly I think that they knew where they live they were using terms that I could it the non-naming way of coping that means they never said rockets or Katusha rockets they said the visitor uh -huh. but one of the things, I mean, this was in the 80s, uh, but the effect of community stress prevention center that is there all the time has helped people to understand they can use those terms, they can be open about it because it's not saying anything about their, uh, uh, I would say, uh, abilities, disabilities, and of course about their mental stability. But, I mean, to destigmatize it, it takes a long way. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you that on the uh, um, um, entrance to our center, it says in bold letters, trauma. Because I think that you need to say to people, you're suffering from something we are willing to talk about it because I think there is a dual suffering. Once you're suffering from trauma and then you suffer from not being able to say I have trauma. Mm -hmm. So you are kind of re-traumatized by that or, or over-traumatized by the fact that you can't share it. And the more you normalize it, and unfortunately, yes, I know that majority of people who are exposed to trauma recover on their own accord uh, quicker or, or slower. But those who have been traumatized many times ask themselves, am I crazy because I'm the only one that is behaving this way? And there were other people, especially when you're talking about the community. I could see my neighbors. I could see my spouse. I can see my children. Why am I suffering? And so it is even more important to say, yes, we don't know why you personally 
have developed these symptoms, but it's not an abnormal uh, uh, condition. In fact, we are trying to to, to uh, um, uh, tell people that uh, PTSD is is not a pathology; it's a kind of a failure in the process of recovery because so many people have been exposed and only f and all of them were on the road to recovery and some didn't make it. But it's not pathology; it's about my mind. Something happened in the on the course of recovery, and we will help you to join the course of recovery as much as possible. Let's let's talk about this uh, uh, the role of imagination um, and and how it plays out with with kids with adults. Talk to us about that. I'm using both imagination and playfulness because what we observed, what we have observed for a long time is that people who are suffering from PTSD cannot be playful. They can't play mm -hmm. mostly because they are getting into this mode that I called on guard. They are standing on guard, not to remember, not to be, uh, uh, um, uh, exposed to anything that might trigger their emotions. And so they're on guard all the time. Once you're on guard, you can't be playful and you don't use your imagination. I need to correct myself. They use imagination only in negative terms. That means mm -hmm. they keep being overwhelmed or trying not to be overwhelmed by their, the images that have been uh, the, uh, the outcome or, or the result of the trauma. And the principle that, that we have developed is based on, first of all, that they are not playing because they're frozen, they're afraid. I mean, if you, if you see a very, very traumatized child coming into the playroom or the play therapy room, in most cases, they will be very, very uptight and frozen, or they will be so... Um, uh, um, um, in, in, a, in a position that they can't really relax, that they will basically destroy the whole room. Um, so what we realize is that you have to reintroduce imagination and playfulness. I agree that imagination is, is a, a source of a lot of suffering. But again, coming from uh, this idea that um, you might call it homeopathy, that same cures same. If, if imagination is the problem, then imagination needs to be the solution. Mm. Um, and to so many clients who said, but I can't use imagination, I said, but you're experts on imagination. Uh, all these nightmares, all these flashbacks are basically images that are coming from the inside. They are not outside and you know they are not outside, but you, you're sure that once they are overwhelming you, you can't really differentiate or you can't give yourself a chance not to be hyper alert, hyper vigilant, not to feel, not to get into any excitement. I mean, negative excitement, of course. So based on that, based on my uh, uh, studies, um, I came to a conclusion, of course, it's my conclusion, that for PTSD people, people who are suffering from PTSD, from PTSD um, images are the part that are the most difficult for them. I mean, imagination, images, memories, pictorial memories, visual memories that are not in existence because it's something of the past, or basically making the life impossible. Mm. And together with that, the in, uh, inability to, to play. I, I can tell you one client of mine once told me, you see, if I am sensitive to my kids and they will start crying, this will put me off of my on guard position. If on the other hand, I will react to them, I will immediately be immersed with my emotions, which I don't want because I'll be off my, uh, my on guard uh, position. And so from that moment, we develop a method to slowly, slowly reintroduce the idea of playfulness. And for that, we develop a method called CFAR-CBT that is a combination of body, 
imagination, playfulness, mm -hmm. and cognition. Um, and we're using cards. We're using cards in order to encourage the client to retell their stories. And because cards, I would say, and in images and pictures are international language, we found that you can use it both with children and adults and in various cultures. And these are not cards that specifically made for trauma or for revealing your story. These are cards that we call therapeutic cards because they have been used in, in mostly in bibliotherapy and storytelling methods, but they are, any cards can, can do it. Unlike virtual reality, I don't need to produce anything. I just allow the client to find six, six is a number that I like, as you understand, six <laughs> cards to start with, and just they either tell me the story whilst looking at the cards, or they can, don't need to tell me the story, but they look at the card, and whenever they move from one card to the other, they just know with their head, and I know they slowly, slowly started to, to tell themselves or to me the story. But where is the playfulness? The playfulness is that I allow them to take out a card that they don't, uh, uh, that they would like to get rid of, which is impossible in reality because the trauma was a trauma. And I also encourage them to look for cards that have they been with them, which I call fantastic reality because it wasn't in reality anyway. Have they been uh, with them in this situation, they could have helped them even though the situation have happened and they can't change the outcome. And the impact of playing with the cards, moving the cards, adding cards, is slowly, slowly introducing them a very simple concept of being flexible, playful, and using imagination. And for me, uh, and, and the method is, of course, studied, and for me, this, this ability to help the client, unlike other uh, methods, A, to be active in the play or in the, I would say, re-narration and editing of the story. But more than that, to be in, an observer on their, of their own trauma. Because you see, in most uh, methods, you're asking the client to close their eyes, to bring the story, or with their eyes open, to remember the story. But here, because they have the cards in front of them, they're actually observers in their own trauma. And I think that this ability to mm. this and being an observer in your own trauma and the editor of your trauma and the wow. player in your cards uh, is, is a new concept of how to help. Wow. And I love that. That's what we do. <laughs> what, one of the things that, that strikes me about that, Muli, is you, you, know, you talked before about uh, one of the symptoms people are dealing with sometimes are, are these flashbacks, these images, and it can be quite frightening for someone to start working with, with the imagination. How do you create that that space of i would imagine would have to be a really safe space how do you what do you do to to, to create that there are many methods are using the concept of safe place uh for instance emdr is asking the person to imagine a safe place again because i'm so much into the visual apparatus based on many studies which you don't have time now i think to 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 address we are actually starting by asking the client to choose a card, to put it on a piece of paper and to expand it with colors, slowly, slowly to create the cards they're choosing are a card that for them reminds them or, or is an image of, of safety, serenity, etc. So we starting with that. We the first phase of the method, C for CBT, is a very much about uh um uh teaching the client how to reduce uh, arousal and anxiety, uh, resourcefulness, how to find basic page, how to find their own resources. Only when they gained all these methods and slowly, slowly they are playing with the cards before they start telling the trauma because they're using it as images of support, images of, of, of safety. 
then we go into the uh, uh, regeneration. And there are other intermediate phases. But the first part of the treatment is safety and security. And we say to them, we won't move anywhere before I'm sure that you have the tools to help yourself. Talking about these images, it's interesting. I was working with parents of children who have been abused, most of them sexually abused, but not by family members. And what these parents told me, you see, I am seeing movies of this horrible event, although they haven't been exposed to the situation, but their imagination is working over time and they see again and again like flashbacks of something they haven't been part of, but because the emotions and, and the need to, to, to have some kind of a grasp on, on what have happened. They keep on imagining horrible things. And the first time they said that someone really took it seriously and asked them, okay, so you have a movie in your head. Try to find those six images here that will help you to tell me this haunting, so to speak, movie was a real relief for them because it wasn't only haunting them, then now it was externalized and they could look at it. Mm. Uh, it was painful. I, 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 I can't say it's not painful, but it's manageable because if, for instance, the client feels overwhelmed, like in any card game, I said, well, let's close all the cards. And this very act that again is of, of very known playful uh, 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 modes of, 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 of uh, games helps them to, to kind of ritually, ritualizing, you know, okay, now we're closing the game and then they can reopen it. Mm -hmm. One other thing I want to say about this method is that you can tell the story from the end to the beginning because you have all the cards. So you can say, you can start with the end and go to the beginning, what we call playback in, in, in films. That you go back, okay? So it, it's interesting way of, of, of helping people to master, to feel in control, and to start feeling that, of course, it's a story. They have the feeling it's a frozen story, and now it's more manageable and flexible. Wow. So inspiring. Muli, I love it. I love talking to you. I'm just realizing that we didn't even get to your book. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to, I would love to invite you back and we can talk about your book if you're up for that. Okay. 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 Yes. Um, yes. As, and I encourage people to read it before we speak because it's a, it's, it has lots of stories. Basically there is a chapter where I actually gave up all my stories because I decided that this book will have all the therapeutic stories that I'm using. So not only what is the meaning and why we need stories, but you have the treasure of the stories that I'm using for 40 years now. So that book is called The Lonely Ape That Told Himself Stories, The Necessity of Stories for Human Survival. We'll have that linked up here at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Muli, as we close out here, um, do you have any book recommendations for whether trauma related or not, or um, story related or not? I would like to not. recommend to you one very good book that is also using a concept of drama, not only of trauma. It's called Trauma Centered Psychotherapy by very good colleagues of mine from the States where I spent some of my sabbatical with them. It's David Reed Johnson, who is a psychologist and his wife, who is a psychiatrist, and her name is Hadar Lubin. It's an amazing book. Take it from a different perspective, and I think it will be helpful to therapists and for people who are interested in the subject. Okay, so this Principles and Techniques of Trauma-Centered Psychotherapy by yes. David Reed Johnson and Hadar Lubin. Yes. Uh, MD. Muli, I want to thank you so much. Um, we'll have you back in... Uh, We'll spend that time talking <laughs> about uh, stories. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right. Once again, thank you to Somatic Experiencing for sponsoring this podcast. Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit 
dedicated to resolving trauma worldwide by providing professional training and education in somatic experiencing. It was founded by Dr. Peter Levine, author of the bestseller, Waking the Tiger, who developed somatic experiencing based on explorations of how animals deal with threat, nervous system overwhelm, and traumatic experiences on a daily basis. Learn more about somatic experiencing and the SE professional training program at traumahealing.org forward slash TTP. That's traumahealing.org forward slash TTP. All right, guys, uh, I just want to say that I am thrilled to have this podcast sponsored by cptsdfoundation.org. You know, a little while ago, I actually got to meet the founder, uh, Athena Moberg of CPTSD Foundation. We met here in San Francisco, sat down, uh, had breakfast, and it was amazing. You know, I got to feel and see her passion, the passion that she has for this work, and not just for therapists and clinicians, but survivors as well. CPTSD Foundation provides peer-led support and adjunctive care in between therapy sessions for survivors of complex trauma. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, survivors can come together to give and receive support and validation and feel equipped with the knowledge and skills they can use every day. You can check it out at cpsdfoundation.org. Their website is amazing. They have daily recovery support. They have free support groups. They have a healing book club. And Trauma Therapist Podcast listeners can get 50% off the first month when they join the daily recovery support calls. So you can check that out by going to cptsdfoundation.org forward slash trauma therapist podcast. Once again, that's cptsdfoundation.org slash trauma therapist podcast. Or just head on over to the website at traumatherapistpodcast.com and click on the link there and you'll be in business. 